Hi everybody. My name is Ailen Mahesh, a PhD candidate here at Iser Pune. I wish you a very happy National Science Day. This day provides us with an opportunity to remind ourselves that science is a part of our culture. The developments in science heavily mark our lives. The idea is to inspire students and the general public to learn science. I made this video because I believe that our understanding of what physics really is creates a passion for physics. Let's talk about what is physics. Well, physics is often referred to as a fundamental science because uh, when we look at the other sciences such as chemistry and biology, underlying them is the subject of physics here. There cannot exist chemistry and biology without physics. So physics is concerned with what the world is made of and how it behaves. There are two aspects to physics. One aspect is concerned with what the world is made of and another aspect with how it behaves. The quest for the best possible model of reality in the language of mathematics. That's what physics is all about. So, see, scientists have obtained this insight into the universe that it has an underlying order. And we all hope that our human mind is capable of discovering the hidden patterns. It is this hope that takes us forward in our quest to obtain better and better models of reality. So let us look at the first aspect of the physics. So when we ask this question, what is the world made of? The answer will be made of two parts here. You see the first part consists of telling what are the building blocks of the world. And the second part consists of the forces operating in the universe. So let's look at the building blocks. And uh, physicists have identified 12 building blocks that are the fundamental constituents of matter. Our everyday world is made of just three of these building blocks, the up quark, the down quark, and the electron. This set of particles is all that's needed to make protons and neutrons and to form atoms and molecules. So let's come to the second part of the answer to this question of what is the world made of. Now these, let's talk about the forces that operate in the universe. Scientists distinguish four elementary types of forces acting among particles, strong, weak, electromagnetic, and gravitational force. The strong force is responsible for quarks sticking together to form protons, neutrons, and related particles. The electromagnetic force binds electrons to atomic nuclei to form atoms. This electromagnetic force and gravitational force are what we deal with in our everyday life. The strong force and weak force are not uh, very familiar to the general public, though particle physicists do deal with them in their experiments in with, uh, accelerators. So, a gravitational force is a very long range force and uh, it shapes the evolution of the universe. Well, uh, okay, so we have uh, given a partial answer to the question of uh, the first aspect of physics, what the world is made of. Coming to the second and more interesting aspect of physics, how the world behaves. Well, uh, to be able to interpret the behavior of the universe, we make a, an interesting assumption here. It is assumed that the behavior is governed by certain laws of nature. Now, uh, we must note here that suppose there do not exist any laws of nature, then as an implication, the subject of physics itself would not exist. So let us just assume that there are certain laws of nature which govern the behavior of the universe and see where it takes us. So it's a, a constant source of joy that there exists laws of nature because this, that laws of nature exist means that we are able to comprehend the behavior of the universe and that we are able to comprehend the universe certainly brings us joy. The patterns underlying the phenomena of nature, which are not immediately apparent, are referred to as laws of nature. But this statement uh, gives a vague definition of what a law of nature is. 
And what does it do for us? Law of nature not only allows us to interpret the behavior, but also allows us to make certain predictions. Law of nature is a generalization that goes beyond our limited observations. That is, it allows us to make predictions. And what form do these laws take? You know, how does a law of nature look? You see, uh, just consider any example that you might know, be it uh, Newton's second law, or the Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism, or Newton's law of electro of gravitation, or with the Schrodinger's equation. What is common among all these laws? What form do all these laws take? These are all mathematical relationships among physical quantities. Well, uh, it's a fact that laws of nature happen to be mathematical relationships among physical quantities. So certain, uh, all the laws of nature have been uh, of certain attributes. So first attribute is that they are uh, phrased in mathematics. Well, uh, if we do not have access to mathematical knowledge, we cannot uh, express the laws of nature. Mathematics is an essential prerequisite to be able to express laws of nature. Now, these laws of nature, they can be either exact or approximate, but they must have been observed to hold without exception, if not universally, then at least under a stipulated set of conditions. Well, let me give an example here. Newton's laws are approximately valid under a limited set of conditions in the set of conditions where the speed of the particles involved is less compared to the speed of light. But within this stipulated set of condition of the speed being very much less than light, these Newton's laws do hold without exception. As soon as we go beyond the condition, as soon as we remove the constraint of the speed being very less, then we, Newton's laws are no longer valid. Then we go for the special relativity. However, Newton's principles can be considered as laws of nature because they do hold universally as long as we stipulate certain set of conditions here. And uh, laws of nature, they cannot be proved. See, these are laws of nature are not mathematical theorems. They are fundamental principles by definition. And hence, we use these laws of nature to deduce other principles and results. But the laws themselves, they cannot be derived from something else. They can only be justified through experiment. Now, uh, it's a very strange fact that uh, mathematics is so useful in expressing laws of nature. And uh, uh, many great physicists have commented on this strange fact. So to get some insight into the relationship of how useful mathematics is, in the study of physics, let us look at this quote by very famous physicist Wigner. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend for better or for worse to our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement, to wide branches of learning. Now, Dirac too, he has expressed uh, his opinion on the fact that uh, mathematics is so useful in the study of nature. It seems to be one of the fundamental features of nature, that fundamental physical laws are described in terms of a mathematical theory of great beauty and power, needing quite a high standard of mathematics for one to understand it. You may wonder, why is nature constructed along these lines? One can only answer that our present knowledge seems to show that nature is so constructed. We simply have to accept it. One could perhaps describe the situation by saying that God is a mathematician of a very high order 
and he used very adverse mathematics in constructing the universe. Einstein too was very much fascinated by the fact that the universe is comprehensible. A very well known quote by Einstein is that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. The basis of that quote is this excerpt from the book Ideas and Opinions written by him. And here if we note, it says, the eternal mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. You see, why is the universe comprehensible? It could have been an orderless and a chaotic world, but it is not. Somehow, uh, the world happens to be comprehensible and it, uh, we really don't know why it is so. Well, has God made it like this? Is there really a God who decided that the world be comprehensible or is it an accident? Uh, we really don't have a proper answer to this question here. That's why Einstein says that there is a mystery. The mystery of is that uh, the world is comprehensible. The fact uh, that the universe uh, is comprehensible is truly a miracle. Uh, in, a, in a letter written to his friend Solovin, Einstein once again expressed uh, his amazement at the fact that the world is comprehensible. It, uh, we can only comment that uh, it's a miracle. Uh, we cannot really give an adequate answer to the fact that uh, it's comprehensible to us through our tools of mathematics. Now, we have noted the fact that uh, laws of nature are mathematical relationships among physical quantities. So to gain a better understanding of the laws of nature, we need to look at uh, the meaning of a physical quantity. Physical quantities are the refined version of our vague notions of reality. Temperature is a refined way of expressing the degree of hotness or coldness. And uh, also interestingly, Power is a refined way of expressing how energetic a person is. You might think that energy would be a better way of expressing how energetic a person is, but that is not true because you see, uh, let's just take a simple example of a person uh, climbing stairs. He starts at the ground floor and runs towards the fifth floor. Now, the person A, who takes five minutes to come to the fifth floor is considered more energetic than a person who takes 10 minutes to reach the fifth floor. Now, in terms of physics, both have expended the same amount of energy to come to the fifth floor. However, the power, the power is more in case of person A. Now, another good example is uh, that of bulk modulus. So, what bulk modulus allows us to do is it allows us to express how difficult it is to compress a body. More is the bulk modulus, more difficult it is to compress that body. Now, you see what we are doing here. Uh, the real purpose of the physical quantities is to establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between our observations of natural phenomena and the representation of these observations in terms of certain mathematical objects. There are several ways in which the correspondence of the objects in the mathematical representation and the observations can be presented. From a practical viewpoint, any one of these approaches is sufficient for our purposes. Now, one standard method consists of postulating the basic equations and observables of physical theory. And then we proceed to demonstrate that the postulated quantities are consistent with all natural observations. Now, the second approach would be to use operational definitions. All quantities will be defined in terms of a set of experimental observations. And these quantities have reality in terms of these results for definition. Now, Let's look at uh, some examples to get a better insight into the meaning of a physical quantity. A very important physical quantity is that of linear momentum. 
linear momentum is defined as a product of mass and velocity. Now, are looking at this deficient, one cannot help but wonder why this particular deficient is chosen. You see, there is a good reason for choosing this deficient. The thing is, we have a law of nature called as Newton's second law of motion, and it turns out to be able to express this law of nature, we need something called as linear momentum. This physical quality, this term P equals mv is required here to be able to write Newton's second law and that is its significance. You see, to give you an example, consider Gauss law. To be able to write Gauss law, we first need to define a physical quantity known as electric flux. The reason we define something called as electric flux is to be able to write Gauss law. And similarly, the reason we define linear momentum is to be able to write Newton's law. Now, another way of looking at the significance of the concept of linear momentum is that it is a concept. A conservation law is considered to be a very powerful tool in physics. And, uh, we have a few conserved quantities in physics and linear momentum is one of them. We cannot uh, lose our sight on conserved quantities. We always uh, keep our eyes open for quantities which are conserved and linear momentum happens to be one of those conserved quantities and uh, that's why it is a very significant quantity. It is significant. P equals mv, this particular quantity of linear momentum is very important to us because it is a conserved quantity, just like energy. The concept of energy is also very important because it's a conserved quantity. And why is uh, kinetic energy defined as mv square by two and not as m square v square by two or mv cube by two or mv cube? That is because we are interested in arriving at a conservation law. If there were no conservation law, there wouldn't have been the concept of energy in physics. So this particular definition as mv squared by 2 allows us to arrive at a conservation law. That is the reason behind defining kinetic energy as mv squared by 2. Defining kinetic energy as mv squared also works. You can, this particular division with 2 is simply a convention which makes it convenient to define work in a simpler way. See, when we look at the work kind kinetic energy theorem, the so work done equals kinetic energy. So if we define kinetic energy as mv square instead of as mv square by 2, then the definition of work would be twice of dot the dot product of force and displacement. So to make it look like the definition of work is just the product of force sign displacement rather than as the twice of the dot product of the force sign displacement, we just bring in a factor of half here. So, well, historically, Lipnitz himself defined kind of energy as just mv square, not as mv square by two. It was a German physicist. Helmholtz, who first defined kinetic energy as mv squared by 2. Now, you see, uh, every well known result in physics is Ohm's law, which relates the current density and the electric field. And uh, looking at this Ohm's law, we must uh, note that it's not really a law of nature here. There are two reasons for this because it is something that can be derived from other fundamental principles. And if you, a particular result is not at all fundamental, then it cannot be considered as a law of nature. And uh, a more serious problem with Ohm's law is that it is not always true. It has exceptions and that uh, immediately rules, it, rules out its status as a law of nature. Another important uh, physical law is that of Schrodinger's equation. So Schrodinger, he has not 
derive this uh, equation it's uh, you see it's not a mathematical theorem like pythagoras theorem or seva's theorem it's a physical law and physical laws cannot be derived or proved mathematically using pen and paper you cannot just prove laws of nature experiments prove laws of nature no so if we didn't prove or derive this equation how exactly did he arrive it is very famous physical law what this austrian physicist even showing the date was he exploited an analogy from optics and uh, guided by mathematical beauty he arrived at this equation one might almost say that he guessed this equation and it turned out that this equation does match with experimental observations and uh, that justifies it you see we don't prove physical laws but we do justify them when you read a book on quantum physics you can't just turn the pages searching for a proof of schrodinger's equation what textbooks do is they do justify the schrodinger's equation and that way is good enough now uh, a very famous uh, result of 20th century physics is e equals mc square e where e stands for the rest energy m stands for rest mass and c is the speed of light now the we cannot view einstein's 1905 paper as a uh, providing a proof that e equals mc square this is not a mathematical theorem to uh, have a associated with it a proof see what einstein did was he provided a convincing argument he was guided by aesthetic reasons and his own uh, superb instincts the real proof came from experimental physics much later in 1933 the daughter and son in law of mary curie took a photograph showing the conversion of energy into mass a quantum of light carries energy up from beneath and in the middle it changes into a mass two freshly created particles which curve away from each other and thus providing a very good demonstration of einstein's uh, instinct that uh, energy and mass are interconvertible now what uh, these guys did is conversion of energy into mass but uh, what about the other way around is it also possible that mass can also be converted into energy that was shown in cambridge by cockcroft and walton who broke apart an atom the fragments had slightly less mass in total than the original atom but they flew apart with great energy thus these two experiments provided the proof that e equals mc square the proof came from experiments not mathematically mathematics only gives convincing arguments mathematics makes it seem plausible but the proofs come only through experimental physicists you see uh, now let me just conclude this talk with a very illuminating remark by a, a great french mathematician regarding the motivations of a scientist the scientist does not study nature because it is useful he studies it because he delights in it and he delights in it because it is beautiful if nature were not beautiful it would not be worth knowing and if nature were not worth knowing life would not be worth living really a very beautiful quote now these are some of the references i have used in preparing this talk if you are interested in probing more details you can go through these well, that concludes my talk thank you